let's get started. Uh, so welcome to the first info session for uh, the Earth Institute's professional learning programs um, under our non-degree programs, which we have officially launched this fall. We're really excited about our uh, non-degree offerings and thank you for joining us today to learn a little bit more about them. Uh, so my name is Cassie um, and I work at the Earth Institute. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Earth Institute, um, our core mission is to foster a greater understanding of the science behind sustainability and the climate crisis and what we as citizens can do. Um, what's really unique about the Earth Institute is that it's actually made up of um, more than 20 or so research centers um, and several hundred people who collaborate across many different disciplines and schools within Columbia University. Um, as an exciting side note, um, the Earth Institute is actually moving forward with efforts to establish the Columbia Climate School, which would be the first uh, new school in about 25 years at Columbia, which is really exciting, and it would be the first climate school of its kind. Um, so as part of that effort, um, we are going to be um, expanding our educational offerings quite a bit, um, both in our degree programs as well as our non-degree programs. Uh, so speaking of non-degree programs, which is what you've all uh, come here to learn more about today, um, and specifically professional learning, um, these are opportunities um, for working professionals and adult learners to join us in um, in workshops uh, throughout the fall and spring semesters um, in small group settings and all of these offerings are going to be online for this academic year um, these aren't formal courses so there's no transcripts from columbia um, the professor or sorry the instructors um, will you know have readings and perhaps tasks and assignments for participants to complete um, and but at the end of the session you don't get a transcript um, everyone receives a certificate of participation though from the earth institute um, with the name of the workshop that you've attended as well as the number of hours that you have attended the workshop for um, it's a great opportunity to network with oh i'm so sorry that's gonna I still have a landline. Um, the, it's a great opportunity to network with peers um, as well as the instructors in the workshops who are all experts in their own fields. Um, and it's a great opportunity to learn in a small group setting um, with a flexible schedule. So because this is our first uh, time offering non-degree programs and specifically professional learning, uh, we have a special inter, um, intro rate that's available um, and it's very competitive um, alongside with other, other similar offerings uh, from other Ivy League institutions. Um, if you have any questions about those rates um, as well as opportunities for reduced rates, please let us know. Um, you can check out our website. Um, we're going to be recording everything today. Um, one second here. We're going to be recording everything today, and so um, you can, uh, we'll be able to send you um, a video of everything. And today, throughout the session, we're going to be utilizing the Q&A box. Um, so please type in questions as you have them, and we'll be monitoring everything. Um, we're going to start with uh, Josh DeVincenzo. And I'll let him introduce himself and he'll share his screen. And he's going to spend the first half of the session telling you about his offering this fall, uh, which is going to be in October. Um, and then we're going to switch gears halfway and then talk about the other workshop that's being offered in November. Um, so Josh, if you want to take it away. Excellent. Uh, and Cassie, the, the landline brought back some nostalgia. So I haven't heard a landline in a while. So that's that pretty funny. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I think it might be best to just uh, share you, uh, with you a little bit of what we have in store for the course and the organization and a little bit of our approach to doing um, this course dedicated to COVID-19 from recovery to resilience. Uh, my, my name is Josh DiVincenzo. I'll go into a little bit more details around my background in a moment, um, but I'm coming from the National Center for Disaster Preparedness, uh, one of the many centers that Cassie mentioned that uh, encompass the Earth Institute here at Columbia. Um, a very relevant center right now. We've been very busy in light of COVID, but we also um, have a long history of uh, disaster management, emergency management from both a research, um, uh, research standpoint, a policy standpoint, and very much so a practice standpoint. 
Um, so I'm really excited for this offering particularly um, because um, there's sometimes some ambiguity with NCDP and what we do. And I'm really excited to see us kind of open our doors to just a, um, a plethora of resources, a plethora of really uh, thought leaders on these on these topics so that we can be um, as, as supportive as, as we can be ambassadors of this knowledge around emergency managers, around emergency management uh, when people need this information the most. So you can see here some of the main themes that we've been covering uh, for a couple of decades now from vulnerable populations to children's health and disasters, workforce readiness, crisis communications, um, and uh, systems response. And these are all different themes that we're gonna be able to uh, touch upon even in this in these five sessions. So uh, we've been really intentional around uh, the course breakdown and um, what is the most important information uh, that needs to go out immediately, as well as we're gonna be gauging our, our learners and our, our participants uh, throughout the process of what information is gonna be most worthwhile to you. Uh, really that's, that's what our mission here is. Um, the class overview, it is going to be framed in the lens of COVID-19, which makes it very unique in the sense that um, it is really going to take more of an action learning approach where we're going to be collaborating, uh, really trying to go a layer deeper on, um, on the discussions around COVID-19 beyond what might be media headlines, anything like that, and taking a look at uh, some of the historic research around disaster preparedness, around mitigation strategies, around response, and uh, looking, at it, looking at it from a very... Um, academic standpoint, but also being able to translate that into uh, tangible things that our, our learners and our participants can bring back to their workplaces. Uh, this is going to be an excellent course for anybody who's uh, potentially thinking about continuing their education for graduate school. Uh, I'm going to be running this, this course, uh, this workshop, very much like a graduate seminar. So it'll be uh, really providing as much information as possible. And it's uh, really on the learner to decide what information is most relevant for them. Uh, but uh, NCDP and our responsibility in, in uh, developing this workshop has been to just make sure you have as many perspectives and angles to disaster preparedness, disaster response in light of in the context of COVID-19 as possible. Um, so the call to learn here, it's, it's very evident. Uh, it's top of mind for everybody around the globe. Um, the, call, the call to learn here is that, we, you know, the frequency and the complexity of these disasters are our are, um, are characterization of the modern day. And for that reason, the idea of disaster management education needs to become broader. It needs to encompass uh, more of a whole community approach. And we'll talk a little bit about what whole community means in, in the context of this course in a second. But uh, this is really a, a major push in disaster management education and, and incorporating other uh, other stakeholders from different sectors, from different academic and um, disciplines and learning together as a really a community of practice approach. As you'll see, there's really not one domain any longer for uh, disaster recovery. And from this idea of going from recovery to resilience, it's gonna take a lot of different people. It's gonna take a lot of um, continuing education, a lot of uh, sharing best practices, looking to the past, looking at the present you know, with a critical lens and then looking towards the future. And that's really what we're looking um, forward to uh, being able to have those dialogues here in this course. So learning outcomes, I think I might have summarized them in kind of that tangent there, but the, in three bullets, uh, really, really in plain terms, is we're hoping to gain an understanding of whole community and a systems approach to managing, disa managing disasters. So looking at one node of a broader network is no longer sufficient. Uh, so what we really want to do and what's really unique to this course offering is to bring in that systems level approach. Uh, we're going to analyze interdisciplinary approaches to disaster management. So um, because this is a course geared and targeted um, to COVID-19 and the pandemic specifically, we'll be hearing a lot from public health experts, but we'll be also uh, incorporating social scientists and really trying to run the gamut on the different perspectives that are required to get to more of that solutions phase uh, for our conversations about COVID-19. Uh, we're also going to apply critical disaster frameworks and strategies. So uh, sometimes it's an aha moment for folks that there's a lot of literature out there. There's a lot of frameworks. There's a lot of thought around um, the uh, disaster response, disaster recovery. And what we want, want to do as a group is really uh, think about it and, and uh, kind of pick and choose what is the most relevant for COVID-19 and what's most relevant for uh, situating ourselves. And that's really going to be a big theme is situating um, either from our professional lens, our company, for example, um, our student lens, our research interests, um, even our family lens of what it means for a household uh, if throughout COVID-19 recovery. Um, so situating yourself in this broader complexity and making it as accessible as possible. Um, a little, about, a little bit about me in more detail is uh, I work as an instructional designer for NCDP. Um, long before COVID, a lot of our work was uh, focused primarily on economic recovery. We work on uh, and housing recovery. We work on uh, national training grants uh, through FEMA. 
Um, and uh, that work has really allowed us to have a very national perspective on emergency response. And uh, these are workshops that I, I serve as an instructor for our, our course on uh, community planning for economic recovery, as well as disaster financial literacy for businesses, and then also disaster financial literacy for individuals and households. And these courses are deployed um, across the country. So we really, and, and have continued to be deployed uh, even in the context of COVID virtually. Um, so we've been able to really get kind of our finger on the pulse of um, at a national level, what this pandemic has meant, especially around economic recovery. And I'm excited to share some of those insights uh, throughout our workshop. Um, other than that, a lot of my work is focused on um, uh, learning technologies, uh, scaling uh, learning initiatives for adult learners. Uh, teaching online is something that I've, I've done uh, quite a bit and I'm looking forward to actually capitalizing on this workshop and the fact that we can reach a broader audience to the table um, for, for this delivery. Um, and then prior to that, I also worked in the, the financial sector. So that's been a, a really uh, interesting frame to approach a lot of these disaster um, contexts and, and uh, challenges uh, from more of that financial lens, especially in the context of economic recovery, uh, which will be one theme in which we'll talk about. Uh, so I'm going to go through a little bit of the course site and uh, give a little bit more detail, of just logistics and how this, uh, what we have planned. Um, so the course schedule we'll have here um, just Wednesdays, uh, we'll be meeting from four to seven. And again, uh, I have a lot of experience teaching as well as learning online. And I know three hours might seem like it's a, lot, a long time to be on Zoom, but we're really uh, looking forward to uh, having some pretty engaging exercises, activities and speakers throughout those three hours. And of course, breaks. I think, I think breaks are very important, um, especially on Zoom. So uh, I look forward uh, to these sessions here. Uh, this is just um, where, they're, uh, where you can find them as well as the, the, the launching the Zoom meeting. Um, when you're when you're enrolled in this course in this workshop, uh, you'll have access to the site. And uh, one thing that we're really excited to do is um, have this site available to you well beyond the course. Um, as you'll see, there'll be a pretty intricate um, resource library, um, and you'll have access to all the modules, video recordings of the the guest speakers, etc. And it'll just be kind of like a living document, especially as we continue to learn more about the pandemic uh, as we go. So this might be something very interesting if you do find yourself in the recovery response. Um, space years years down the road uh jumping back to this url and just taking a look at oh these were the conversations we we're having around COVID 19. um and again this is also just going to be an excellent resource for anybody that now finds them in a professional occupation where you're now responsible for any type of response or recovery um initiative strategies at your at your organization so this is a nice onboarding uh to uh everything that uh, we're thinking about on a daily basis so to do this, we have five modules. Um, I'm, I have a timer going just so I don't uh, run into Melody and John's time. Uh, uh, so we're, we're good so far. Um, but the class modules here is again, gonna be uh, encompassing whole community. So what that means is uh, we're trying to engage learners from private, public, um, business, faith-based community, uh, communities, disability organizations, general public, in conjunction with any government partners um, to really set the foundation for a social infrastructure and a network um, approach to disaster management education. Um, so each workshop is going to include a voice from the field talk. So it won't just be me uh, for three hours, uh, rest assured. Um, we'll also have interactive exercises and then uh, several discussion boards that are going to be taking um, place uh, synchronously and asynchronously. So there'll be a lot of opportunities for input. Um, one unique thing about this course is the fact that uh, I think I really called in all my favors uh, in terms of guest speakers that will be uh, welcoming to this course. So I'm not sure if we'll ever get this lineup again, um, but everyone has been very excited to, to join and to share some of their knowledge, some of their tenure. Uh, so you can see here, each module will have its own theme. So the first module is gonna be uh, dedicated to mapping, and expanding the field, of, um, the field of emergency management disaster uh, response um, in the context of COVID-19. So talking about um, the field itself, uh, some of the major changes, uh, and then what it means in the context of COVID-19, of course. Uh, really excited to have uh, Jeff Slegelmelch, our director of NCDP, who will be joining us for that first session. He also has a, uh, a fascinating book that just came out, Rethinking Readiness. Uh, it's required reading. It's, it's really uh, not required reading for this course, just required reading in general, uh, but it, it is really a nice introduction to um, readiness and preparedness themes uh, in the context of today. Uh, so excellent book and he'll be, he'll be discussing a little bit of those uh, major themes uh, in the context of COVID-19. Uh, we have another module that's going to be community lifelines and recovery timelines. So trying to really engage and understand how long recovery truly does take even beyond 
uh, media coverage, for example, uh, to, to talk to us there. We're going to have Dr. Tom Chandler, research scientist at NCDP, also the PI, the principal investigator on the FEMA projects that I work on, uh, and just really just an abundance of knowledge. Um, crisis leadership and communications at the federal, state, and local uh, and general public level is going to be its own module. Um, working on an invite to a very interesting uh, guest lecture. I hope uh, he signs on, um, but more to come on that. It's going to be a TBD. Uh, module four is going to be focused on um, a, fo uh, a focus on high risk, underserved, and vulnerable vulnerable populations in disasters. Uh, we would completely miss the mark if we didn't have a module dedicated to this topic. Um, I invited uh, Aina uh, Wingardner uh, from uh, NCDP as well, who is very focused on um, just this topic as well. As well. Uh, she worked with a foundation called Somos in a Bolsa. Uh, uh, I think it was uh, sponsored by Mark Anthony um, down in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. So she coming um, from a really interesting angle around working with volunteer organizations in times of disasters and uh, really excited to hear from her. And then the last but not least, um, we're going to be wrapping up with the topic of COVID-19 uh, lasting impacts and onward. And for that, um, and this is tentative, we have to work with his schedule a little bit here, uh, would be Dr. Erwin Redliner, who's been one of um, the leading voices on the, on the pandemic uh, at, at a national level. You may have seen him on MSNBC. Uh, he was the former director of NCDP, now is the director of NCDP's uh, Pandemic Resource and Response Initiative. Um, they've been incredibly busy um, uh, recently, and uh, he's just, there, there is no more tenure than, than uh, Dr. Leonard on these subjects. And so it's, it's going to be really, really a privilege to wrap up this workshop uh, hearing from him. Um, the last thing I'm going to say, and we just jump into one module, it just is, is really going to be this, we're going to try to for, uh, follow a nice formula uh, for each session. So you'll see a session agenda, you'll see a bio of our guest lecturer, you'll have uh, access to the session resources, it'll, it'll all be there. So this website is really going to be uh, aimed to make it as easy for navigation easy for communication as possible. And one um, last thing is uh, what we're going to be doing as a kind of a group project is going to be doing a COVID-19 time capsule. And it goes back to that point of having access to this website for life um, and, and being able to kind of be a historian in that sense of what, what, what was the news saying at this point? What were the academic journals uh, saying at this point? And aggregating all of that and having this nice COVID-19 time capsule that we can look back on, on what did we think about emergency response at that point? What did we learn? Um, so we're going to be covering a lot of ground in these modules. Um, and I'm really excited that NCDP has been able to, um, been, uh, to support this initiative, to uh, share their research, to share their time, to share their findings. Because I think getting the messaging out around this type of education um, and making it applicable to all different domains, I think that's really uh, what the value add of having this workshop is just having an entry point for people that um, were curious about disaster management, that are curious around um, how these things are handled at a federal, state, a local level, curious about what it means for populations that are often marginalized or not thought about, um, and, and being able to engage in those conversations, to be engaged in that research, to be engaged in that practice. As we'll see, that's going to be ever more important at a national level um, uh, going forward, because uh, this won't be an isolated event where we're going to need that whole community, that multi-stakeholder approach. So it's going to be a great learning journey. Um, I'm excited to be facilitating it, but you can see I'm going to be supported by some really great thought, uh, great thinkers and uh, great practitioners. Um, and uh, we hope to really uh, have a nice program for any, any learner at any level um, that, is, that is, wants just an entryway into this, into this space. Because uh, at the time of having this be kind of its own island and exclusive thing it is long over as what we've seen with the pandemic as it's been felt globally. Um, I think I'm right at my mark. Uh, so I'm going to pass it over to Cassie, I believe, and then uh, we'll hear from Melody and John. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Josh. Um, and for our attendees, if you have any questions about either the workshop or about our professional learning um, offerings in general, um, feel free to type it into the, that Q&A box. Um, Josh, I think you've really hit an important point, and this goes also for the other um, workshop offering, is that this is um, the fact that you know, you um, participants would not only get to learn from uh, Columbia experts, um, but the the network and the reach of the Earth Institute and our staff and our faculty and our researchers um, is quite impressive. You know, we're 
the, all the research units are very well connected to uh, different types of organizations. Um, and that access is something that's, that's really important. Um, and I think that Josh, through his example um, of all the different speakers you might hear from or learn from in the, in the workshop is really important. Um, and Josh, I, you know, I have a question for you while we, I, we'll, we'll wait and see if there are um, any questions from the, uh, from the audience members. Um, but for those who are not necessarily in emergency management or disaster preparedness, you know, as you mentioned briefly, this is sort of a nice gateway or introduction to the, to the workshop. Um, what other, um, if you can think of any other groups, for example, you know, uh, teachers sort of came, came to mind. Um, you know, if you're an educator or um, you work in education of some kind um, and, and you're not necessarily in, involved in day-to-day -day disaster management, this could certainly be relevant. Um, so in your, in your, uh, from your perspective, um, who else might this, um, this workshop be relevant for? Not, just, not necessarily just those, of, um, those who are already in disaster uh, management work? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, the, really, this is our attempt to open up the field um, because it, it it really, the teacher is as much as a first responder in many ways as, as most. Um, one one quick uh, narrative would be uh, we, in one of our courses on economic recovery, we had a librarian there. Um, so someone that just worked at the local library in, in New Jersey, I believe it was the state that we were working with at that time. And um, everyone was going around, they're like, oh, I'm a first responder, I'm a firefighter, I'm a, a and everything like that. Um, some, some of the usual suspects that you would expect at one of our FEMA trainings. Um, and the librarian was like, oh, I'm a library. I'm a librarian at our local public library. And we're like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. What brings you in today? And she's like, well, where do you think people go to get information uh, in the case of a disaster? or in case for economic recovery, they're coming to me. And like, I want to be a resource um, around what they what resources are out there at the federal level, at the state level, the local level, uh, even what to just Google, uh, I want to be to serve, I want to be there to serve that function. And um, that's the story that's really stuck with me of like, how important it has been to um, include everybody into into these conversations, because you could be the librarian, or you could be that resource, even to your family. I, I mean, there's, um, uh, there needs to be some go to foundational knowledge um, across the community. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so just a quick recap here for Josh's workshop. Um, the workshop's name is COVID-19 from Recovery to Resilience. Um, it is, uh, registration is open. And um, just a quick reminder on the dates, it starts October 7th and it's every Wednesday. So once a week, it will end uh, Wednesday, November 4th. Um, and he will do um, the workshop during the 4 to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, time slot. Um, so if you do have additional questions, um, Josh is going to stick around. Um, so we are going to turn it over to um, Melody and John. So John and Melody are um, co-instructing the, um, the other workshop on UN climate negotiations, and they're both from the International Research Institute for Climate and Society. Also um, a very actually active and one of the largest units in, uh, within the Earth Institute. Um, so I'll turn it over to them. Hey, great, thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm gonna share my screen as well, although Melody and I do not have quite as snazzy a presentation as Josh did, but um, let's see. Where is, the, oh, there it is. Okay. Can everybody see that? Okay, so our topic, our topic is um, the UN climate neg negotiations. Why is a deal so elusive? Um, uh, as Cassie said, it's uh, Melody and I are going to work on it, and we have a third colleague named Lisa Nebier who will also be working with us. I'll start with a quick introduction of myself. Um, I'm John Furlow. I'm the deputy director of the IRI. IRI is one of the Earth Institute um, centers, and we specialize in seasonal forecasting and El Nino prediction. And then we also specialize in taking that climate information and translating it for use by decision makers in different fields, such as agriculture, public health, et cetera. And we work almost entirely in the developing world. Um, 
Before coming to IRI, I worked at the U.S. Agency for International Development for about a decade. I led the, the ad climate adaptation work um, there. And I was a part of the U.S. negotiating de uh, teams, delegations, to the U.N. climate conferences from 2006 to 2016. Um, with the exception of, I think it was 2012, I did not go to the annual meeting. Um, so what I bring to this is a view of what the really the, the biggest national actor at the negotiations went through. I also started under the Bush administration and then we transitioned to the Obama administration. Um, so we I can also bring the perspective of what happens when there's a pretty significant change in the um, views of the U.S. administration. Um, so we'll get into the details, but I'm going to let Melody introduce herself before we go into the more of the course. Thanks, John. And hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. My name is Melody Brown. I've been at IRI for about six years. Uh, my background is environmental science and sustainable development. And my experience of the COP and the climate negotiation is quite different from John. Um, my first COP was Copenhagen, COP15, which was supposed to be the summit that was going to change the world. And I went there as a student as part of several groups of climate justice activists. Um, we went by train with 800 other activists. We, I was there to produce a, an amateur documentary movie on the role of civil society in the negotiations and the, the expectations that they had from that specific summit. Um, I also had an accreditation to enter the, the negotiation space from a civil society youth organization. And Copenhagen turned out to be a disaster. Um, they accredited too many people. I was part of several thousands of people stuck in front of the gate on the second week, not being able to enter despite our accreditations. And I waited for like a day and a half in the cold uh, among representatives of grassroots communities and farmers who were coming from all around the world with the expectation that because this was a summit that was supposed to address the climate crisis, they were going to be given a voice and an opportunity to express how they were seeing consequences of climate change on a daily basis. And so I couldn't enter, they couldn't enter. We ended up in the parallel um, public summits and there was a really interesting mix of emotions there. Obviously, a lot of frustration and, and despair from a lot of people, but also um, a lot of like a big solidarity and this very um, constructive um, moving forward behavior and approach where this group of people were saying, we're not going to let people who have no idea what we experience on a daily basis, we're not going to let them silence us. We're going to organize ourselves. We're going to be heard. We're going to make sure our demands are, are heard and, and are taken into consideration. And we're going to make sure we have a seat at the negotiation table. And I thought that was really inspiring. And, and basically, long story short, after that experience, I, I worked on adaptation to climate change with grassroots communities in Bangladesh for three years. And then I joined IRI. And at IRI, I've been working on um, strategies that help decision makers uh, better adapt to climate shocks, either via, via uh, financial uh, instruments, such as weather index insurance that we're going to talk about a little bit uh, briefly during the course, or via just a better integration, a better use of climate information to, to adapt to, uh, to climate impacts. And so I've never stopped following the climate negotiations. I've been to, to seven so far, including the past five, uh, mostly focusing on adaptation and loss and damage, which we will explain. And so unlike John, I've never been part of an official country delegation. Um, I've always been part of civil society groups that are trying to influence the negotiations uh, as observers um, and really trying to focus on grassroots needs and, and grassroots demands. So that's that's the aspect that I can bring to, to this course. Over to you, John. Thank you, Melody. Um, our third colleague is Lisa Nebier. She is a, um, a researcher with IRI as well. And the perspective she brings is um, she is from uh, Burkina Faso in West Africa, and she has spent time training delegates and civil society actors from different countries in West Africa in particular 
uh, building their capacity to implement some of the things that are agreed at the climate conferences. Um, in particular, national adaptation plans, which are plans that countries come up with to explain how they intend to address the climate risks that they're facing in their countries. Um, and we'll, again, we'll get into that during the course and the role that those play um, in the course. So a quick overview of what we're gonna cover. Um, we will start on why did the countries of the world think we needed to negotiate a deal on climate? We'll talk a little bit about the science, but this will not be a science course. Um, we'll talk enough about it to, so that everybody understands why the world felt there needed to be a political response to motivate action to address the risks. We'll talk about what is the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, we will let you read it, but we won't make you read it. I find reading um, treaty documents to be somewhat boring. Um, but beyond that, we'll talk about how it was developed, who it's for, who are the um, parties that are members of the convention, who's responsible for taking action on it, how do they arrive at decisions, which gets back to why is a, de a deal been so elusive. And then we'll talk about a, what is the COP. The COP is the Conference of the Parties. It's also the name for the meeting that takes place every, usually every November or December. Um, we'll talk about the, the different factions of countries that are actors. It's a consensus process, meaning everybody has to agree before they can reach a decision. And so you have countries like the US, the Europeans, Japan, China, but there's 197 countries that are members of the UN Framework Convention. So they all have to agree. How do you align that many different interests um, in order to get an, to get an agreement? Um, and then, as Melody was talking about the role of civil society, um, at each COP, each December, it's, there's the negotiation, but there's also what amounts to a massive trade show of everybody working on climate issues comes to talk about their work. Some are sharing products. I rode in, the first time I rode in an electric car was at a COP. Um, so it's very interesting at, to try to understand how different business groups, civil society groups, religious groups, you name it, they're all there and they're trying to influence the negotiators and the negotiations. Um, we'll talk, uh, we want you all to understand what are the major issues being discussed? The biggest one is mitigation. The whole purpose of the COP, of the, of the convention, is to reduce emissions. Um, but over the last 15 or so years, the role and the importance of adaptation, responding to the impacts, has grown as failure to reach an agreement on reducing emissions from energy and land use became apparent. The importance of adaptation, particular, particularly for poor countries, became more and more important. And then in the last eight years, maybe, the role of loss and damage has become more important. So as we fail to adapt, or as adaptation is not, is seen to be inadequate to addressing the impacts of change, things that there will be damages that are unavoidable, there will be total losses that are unavoidable. So what do we do about that? How do we put mechanisms in place to help countries deal with loss of land, loss of water, loss of culture that comes with those losses? Um, and then one, we'll talk in more detail about the role of insurance and other financial mechanisms to help, help countries deal with the losses that are being faced. And then in the much bigger picture, who pays for all of these things that are agreed? Um, and that has often been the sticking point that has pre prevented the countries from getting to a deal. We'll talk about some of the major meetings, the major COPs, um, Kyoto and the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, Copenhagen, which was Melody's first COP, um, and what seemed like a very promising thing and then it fell apart in the last few days after I had left. I left thinking everything was going well. Um, I got home and learned that everything had fallen apart at the last minute. Um, all the countries regrouped and we'll talk about the transition that took place, the change in approach from Copenhagen to Paris and getting the Paris Agreement, um, which in one sense seems like the end, but it's really the beginning or the end of the beginning. Um, and the Paris Agreement puts in place a number of 
measures that sort of self-correct and, and continue to ratchet down emissions and ratchet up effort, um, but it has to be watched. It has to, the countries have to continue to agree on how much is enough. So we'll talk about what comes after Paris. Um, we'll do this, we call them lectures here, but through briefings or something, it's not gonna be hours of us talking to you and, and you having to listen and take notes. Um, we want it to be very interactive. There'll be a lot of discussion, a lot of time for questions and answers. Um, we have a number of guest speakers. We have uh, other government ministers. We have former U.S. negotiators. Um, we may have one or two current U.S. negotiators. They're weighing whether they can take part. Um, we have leaders of civil society groups and representatives of business. And so we think that through these different guests, you'll get a, a good understanding of the different interests that are competing for attention and for um, prominence at the negotiations, which will give insight into why it's been difficult to get an overarching deal and to follow through on what deals have been made. And then depending on the appetite um, of the participants, we can play games where we put you into the role of a negotiator um, and give you a sense of what it's like to be there and to take on a role in a set of interests and try to come to an agreement with people who may be given a very different role, very different interests, but you all have to agree. Um, so with that, I will stop, see if Melody has anything to add. And I'll stop sharing. Let's see. Yeah, maybe just briefly, um, the way we imagined this discourse is really to give you sort of a, a different vision, a different understanding of what's happening at COP that is often not portrayed in the media. And we see that COP after COP after COP, the media is usually at the end of the COP say, oh no, another failure, they haven't addressed the climate crisis. And a lot of people are asking like, what do you do when you go to COP? Like, how does it work? What what is literally what is happening there between all those different stakeholders that have different different interests so we wanted to give you a, a better idea of the complexity uh behind this process by bringing in people representing those different stakeholders different groups of stakeholders and by by giving you a bit of an overview of or of what's happening behind those doors that that is not necessarily available um, in the media. And that explains why, for example, we talk about the Paris Agreement as being the best possible deal that could have occurred, but also completely insufficient. So why is that? What does that mean? And so we want to unpack um, those sort of hidden aspects of COP and the, the complexity of it with you, with you guys. And then ultimately, we'd like you to be able to think about the COP and the climate negotiations in the context of your own lives, your own businesses, what would it mean for you if you work in civil society, if you are a natural gas trader, um, somewhere in between? We wanna make sure that you understand the debates that are taking place and how they might ripple back on the US economy, a developing country's economy, Europe's economy, and understand why these competing interests have added up to some of the difficulties that Melody just mentioned. So Haley, I'm oh, sorry, um, Cassie, back to you. Great, thank you. Um, so thank you so much, um, Melody and John, for that overview. Um, again, I think I want to reiterate the fact that um, you know the 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 number of experts in this in the Zoom session, um, but also leading these workshops, um, is it's immense. I mean, you know, to learn from people who have been to COPs themselves, um, and to uh, and to really understand what goes on in the room. I think Melody makes a great point about how a lot of times what we read about as outsiders, as those who are not there from the media, is not actually an accurate representation of what is what is happening in those negotiations. Um, and I remember, you know, when in one of my first Earth Institute faculty meetings, um, Scott Barrett, uh, who is a professor at SIPA at the School of International Public Affairs, 
talked about the importance of sort of negotiations, and I think his his um, research was more game theory and and um, and what happens at negotiations. So I think it's such an interesting topic, um, and thank you for for that great presentation, um, John. The you know I'll get things started if our viewers have any questions for either John. Um, Melody or Josh, um, or for us about um, overall sort of logistics of the program, feel free to type it into the Q&A box. Um, but John and Melody, to unpack the, the sort of last point that you talked about a little bit more, um, you know, for, this is sort of a similar question to what I asked Josh, um, and it's, it's, you know, who do you, um, envision this this workshop for what could it be helpful for um, you know we don't necessarily have to be um, affiliated with the United Nations at all to take a, a workshop like this we don't even necessarily have to work sort of in that realm um, and so what do you think um, who do you think um, could could benefit from these um, workshops you know Josh gave that example of the librarian and how the librarian is a great resource um, for uh, disaster uh, related information and, and recovery and um, processes. Um, so, from your from your perspective, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit. Um, but just, you know, who who do you think might um, benefit from the workshops? Is it students? Is it working professionals? Retired professionals? Or all of the above? And and you know, I think you um, hinted at this a little bit. But um, if you if you could comment a little bit more on that, that'd be great. Sure. Um, well, I'll start by saying that we're not really intending this for current negotiators. Um, so I don't know if any of the people that are online work in, in the climate negotiations, but um, this is not for that. What we've talked about, I think it would be um, great for students who might be interested in going into that line of work, someone who might have the opportunity to go to a COP. It's a very confusing thing to walk into. Um, and so figuring out whether your organization or uh, you as an individual or your business might like to go and represent yourself um, and meet other people might be interesting for you. I think businesses and those investing investors might want to pay attention because the way that the Paris Agreement is implemented has the potential to restructure the energy and transportation markets and land use as well. So there's a study by the UN that looks at how labor costs could change if there were an international carbon tax. And when you look at it, they looked at the um, gross domestic product per ton of carbon emitted and the cheap countries or middle income countries that are that have currently have a relative advantage in for low cost labor, if you were to impose a carbon tax, that advantage goes away. Um, the US is among the most competitive countries in terms of value added per ton of carbon. Europe is a close second and Japan. Um, but the advantages of Eastern Europe, China, um, the former Soviet Union fall away if if you have to pay for carbon. So I think thinking about the way that the negotiations might play out um, and what the next administration, whether it's Trump or Biden, might do um, and how that would bring along the rest of the world has the potential to really impact the way the world does business. And so I, I think people that uh, have a stake in that world might want to pay attention. Um, and then I think also for civil society and figuring out, trying to understand how you might influence the way that the next steps are taken would also be of interest. Melody, anything to add? Yeah, I think what we really want to capture with this course is the diversity of, of opinions coming into the, the space of the UNFCCC and the climate negotiations. So as John said, yes, if you're a business, if you're a student and you're trying to see how those negotiations will impact you or how you can have an influence on the negotiations. If you're part of, I don't know, if you work in the, in the development world, um, if you're like NGO or research, um, there's also a lot happening in the corridors. There's this, this networking that's going on between organizations working on different topics, which can be focusing on mitigation, adaptation, loss and damage. It can be agriculture. It can be, I don't know, aviation. It can be different things, but there, there are, 
there are these networks of stakeholders working on each of these issues that are meeting every year at the COP that are working together on strategies to, to make progress on those specific topics. So if you're working in any topic that is related to um, the need to address the climate crisis, um, and maybe you're familiar with like one aspect of the negotiations, but not the others. If you're interested in better understanding one specific topic or the diversity of opinions and, and, and how it all comes together, I think then, then the course would make sense and, and hopefully would be, would be of interest to you. All right, excellent. Um, so we have a quiet crowd. So I'm going to um, assume that there are no, if there are no questions, um, Haley and I are available. Um, Haley Martinez, she's on the on the call. Oh, we had you have one question. Um, so when will the UN uh, negotiation workshops be held? So um, the answer to that is um, they start in November, actually. So John, uh, Melody, and Elizabeth's workshop, um, they're going to be on Tuesdays and Thursdays um, from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, the And it's going to be over one, two, Two, three, four, five, six, seven sessions, and with the last sessions, um, it'll be three hours. Um, so in total, there'll be 15 hours of um, actual sort of workshop, live workshop um, time, like Zoom sessions, um, and then individual instructors may also choose to do sort of office hours, or if there's additional questions, um, additional phone calls. And, and the dates are all listed on our uh, website, which is learn.ei.columbia.edu, um, and our uh, email address is also learn at uh, ei.columbia.edu. Um, and thanks, Haley, for putting that information in the chat box. Um, if you have any additional questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us um, afterwards. Um, I want to thank uh, Josh, John, and Melody for your time today. Um, and as I said, this session has been recorded and we'll be, share we'll be sharing the link with everybody um, very soon. And any additional um, things you want to mention, John, Melody, or Josh? Nope, just thanks everybody for joining us. We hope to see you later. Yeah, great. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, um, and um, we'll be we'll be following up with everyone who attended and, and registered, and we hope to see you in a future uh, future workshop. And if you think that there are others um, who might be interested in additional info sessions, we'll be doing um, more next week with Josh, um, and also once again with John and Melody in the in the near future as well. So all of those info session dates are also on our website. Uh, so. Thank you again, everybody, for joining, and we hope you have a great afternoon or evening. All right. Bye, everyone.